So I am here with Ray Radford, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, and Professor Carol Cusack, and we are coming to you from Australia, although we do have a slight secret in that Carol is actually not in Australia, but through the magic of the interwebs, the Aussies have joined together, and we are going to chat about what has been going on in Australia in the last little while in terms of religion and religious studies and all sorts of things um, that will interest all of you listening at home. So let's start with Carol. What have you been up to of late and tell us where you are? I'm in Oslo in Norway at the moment, Bree, and I've been here now since early April working on a large religious grant project that's hosted by the Centre for Advanced Studies here, and it's called The Demise of Religions, and it's not looking at demise in the sense, say, of the secularization thesis and seeing religion disappear. Rather, it's looking at specific religious groups that came into existence at a certain point and that came to an end at a certain point. And I guess a lot of people ask for an example, and this one is not, in fact, a dead religion, not yet. But, for example, the Shakers in America have only two members left, both of whom are elderly. They no longer accept converts, and they have never accepted replenishment of the community by sexual relationships and children. So when these two last Shakers die, which cannot be too long, that will be an example of the kind of religion that we are interested here in the Demise Project, a religion that has come to an end. But the group so far, who include, it's really great people to work with, I'm extremely privileged to be here, Uh, Mikkel Stausberg from the University of Bergen and Jim Lewis from Tromso are the two chief investigators, but we have sociologists of religion like Stuart Wright from Lamar in Texas and people who work on Japanese new religions, Erica Baffelli from Manchester, people who work also in the ancient world and the medieval world on religions that have ended. And mostly what we're doing at the moment is collecting threatened religions. So it's a little bit like threatened species. We're looking for something that's a bit like the koala, you know, the the actual habitat's almost gone and there are reasons to worry. And we're trying to map or chart these kinds of religions. Well, we'll forgive you for not being here in Australia for the sake of such an interesting project. Are you going to sort of think about, I mean, they're sort of critically endangered and endangered when we talk about animals. Are you going to go in that sort of direction? Actually, it's interesting. A lot of the models that we're trying to use are derived either from language death, because that's one area that's been very strongly um, studied by linguists. But yes, actually, species extinction, so threatened, endangered, threatened, completely and absolutely extinct are kind of categories that we are working with. And Ray? Are you working on extinct religions at the moment or what are you up to? I mean, that's a much more interesting than what I'm up to. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, when I'm not rabbit holing down very, very weird paths, I am uh, looking into First Nation history because um, part of my PhD is looking at the First Nations of Canada and America and who are very much alive and are very much attempting to rebuild and reassert themselves through um, a form of, well, you could think of it as syncretic religion, you know, this sort of taking bits and pieces from different tribes to rebuild what they have lost through colonization, um, very much hoping to reinvent and reinvigorate their, their own beliefs. Um, and that's, I, I feel like I'm very much uh, not in tune with, you know, 6,000 years worth of history for some tribes, you know, some tribes it's even older. Um, Yeah, so that's that's where I'm at. I've had a similar experience with what I've been up to at the moment, which is I've just come back from the Australian Museum and Galleries Association conference um, where I spoke about human rights educational pedagogy in the museum space and it was the first time I'd ever been to the Red Centre of Australia, to Alice Springs, and my ignorance about Indigenous culture and Indigenous religion, gosh, it just slapped me across the face and I learned so much. But 
you know, this this culture that's, you know, the oldest, one of the oldest, oldest living cultures in the world and, you know, right in the heart of our own nation. I just, I know nothing. And it was really quite shocking to me. But we should move on from catch-ups and talk about what's been going on in Australia at the moment. Now, Carol, I understand you picked up something just a couple of hours ago that's of particular note that we should chat about. Yeah, I was thinking about controversy and whether we should kind of go in that direction. But it would be a mistake, I think, to be overly scrupulous and not talk about the conviction of Cardinal George Pell for historic child sexual abuse, because Cardinal Pell has been a polarising figure in Australia for many years. And of course, since the conviction, there is still a very strong polarised reaction in Australia with many people occupying the space in which they support Pell and claim that the conviction is wrongful and he is innocent, with just as many people obviously coming from the point of view of the child rape survivors, Mm -hmm. suggesting that blaming the victim and failing to understand the conditions that mean that people very often don't attempt to gain restitution um, against their abusers for decades is a very, you know, it's a complex area. And, of course, it's playing out in media terms around the world because recently the documentary Leaving Neverland about two of the boys who claim historical sex abuse against Michael Jackson has been playing to, again, similarly powerfully polarised audiences. But the item that appeared on the ABC News website only four hours ago, so it's very new, is actually about the process for Pell to mount an appeal. And we knew that this was going to happen. Can we just confirm how many years he actually originally received? Was it, it was, it was, I felt small, but the number is not coming to me. It was a six year sentence. Mm, That's right. And it's important, I think, for our listeners who don't follow Australian news to know that there was, in fact, only one living uh, complainant, though his account was corroborated by the diary of the other victim who had since died. And what's really interesting about the appeal question is that it will be heard next week, I believe, but he has decided to appeal the conviction but not to appeal the sentence. And I think this tells us something about the very muddled kind of popular opinion we have in Australia about Pell at the moment because the only way you can appeal the sentence is to argue that it is manifestly excessive And I think that a lot of Australians who look at one dead young man and one young man whose life is clearly by and large in ruin, well, they're not that young anymore, but uh, by, by and large his life has been ruined by the experience, to actually for a, a clergyman and for the Catholic Church to be seen to put their weight behind the argument that the sentence was manifestly excessive, I just don't think would wash. Yeah, I think the the backlash that I I saw around the original conviction was around the actual short nature of the conviction itself, the fact that he only received six years. And I, I believe the words of the um the magistrate were something along the lines of um because of your advanced age, we want to provide you the dignity of um serving your final years actually back in the community. So they sort of had this idea that he would serve the six years and then go back into the community because he was elderly and therefore shouldn't pass away um, in custody, in jail. And I I think the also the nature about which he was sort of given this, I mean, there was the sentence and then the conviction and he was sort of given this immediate sort of little off because of his age and because of 
the the perceived backlash that was going to be there even before the first conviction came out. And so the idea that he's not appealing the conviction, I mean, the conviction, I'm not no, appealing. He's appealing the appeal conviction but yeah. not the sentence. So the idea that he's not appealing the sentence, I think, I mean, it could go up. So, I mean, he's probably smart in appeal, not appealing the sentence, but I, I'm not sure as to what the logic is here. I mean, he's already sort of moved through this sort of media scrutiny ar- around the original conviction and the sentence. Why do you guys think he's deciding to do that? It, I mean, is it him kind of admitting some form of guilt? But not as much as he's been. Yeah, there's sort of like um, there's, there's a thing, it's called an Alfred plea, which is, you know, you, you plead guilty, but you maintain your innocence. But, you know, you, you have this idea that the, the state can have enough evidence to convict you. I don't think that's a, that's very much an Australian thing. It's very much an American thing. Um, but, you know, if you're going to convict, uh, not convict, if you're going to, um, you know, sort of go, well, my sentence is too much, but not maintain your innocence. So it's kind of like him saying he's guilty, but that he should be out earlier. Mm-hmm. At least that's to me. Carol, do you think it's just a rhetorical thing? I see the whole thing as much more strategic than that, Ray, though I do agree that you've got a point. I think the issue is that he's going to dispute and appeal the verdicts. The team, the legal team, apparently will argue the verdicts are unreasonable. And what they're going to argue on is the fact that there is only one complainant and yeah. Bell had so many character witnesses and other people supporting him. And it seems to me that what that would mean in a way is that it is partly about him as a person, and you're correct, Brianne, he's 78, so if he were to serve the full six years and come out into the community and not have died in prison, he will be in his middle 80s. But I think that if you can quash the conviction, then that lets the Catholic Church off the hook because Mm. one of the things that a lot of our listeners won't know is that even though Cardinal Pell is a figure in Australia, he is also one of the most senior or was until this this legal action, one of the most senior Catholic clerics in the world. And so it's a body blow to the church for a sentence to be passed on him and for a conviction to be recorded. So if you can lift the conviction, the church would be, well, I don't know, I think they probably think they would have dodged a bullet. It strikes me, however, that even if the convictions were quashed on appeal, um, those parts of the Australian public who have kind of decided what they think about this um, will not be uh, likely to change their opinion about George Pell. Yeah, for me it's almost as though he's sort of, as you say, Carol, strategically, in inverted commas, taking one for the team. You know, like I will serve my sentence but I want this image of the Catholic Church to be Mm. sort of somewhat pieced back together. And the interesting thing, um, there's a TV show that's aired of late um, I think while you've been away, Carol, called Christians Like Us. And it's a, a second se- season of a series. Um, last year they aired Muslims Like Us where they get 10 Muslims from different backgrounds and put them all in a house and force them to live together. And this season was 10 Christians in Sydney and forcing them to live in, the, in a house together. And, of course, Pell came up and the idea of, of um, church sexual abuse came up and there was all this idea about, well, the Anglican church would never do that. The Anglican church doesn't have this sort of problem. This is a Catholic church problem and this idea of this rhetoric around it's it's a church institutional problem. And then, of course, somebody stood up in in, in amongst the 10 housemates who had been a victim of church sexual abuse from within the Anglican church and then all of a sudden the conversation around the Anglican Church as a whole changed because the, the, the image of that institution had changed in their minds. So I, I think, you know, Pell is being strategic here, in, as, as I said, in perhaps taking one for the team if we want to put it in those sorts of words. 
I think that's a good way of putting it. But I also think it shows you. I'm really interested in the program you've just described and I'd love to see it. But I was just going to say, I think it shows that people have very short memories because mm. the archbishop whom John Howard made governor general, Peter Hollingworth, actually was forced to resign his position because of the cover-up of sexual abuse, admittedly not homosexual, not of teenage boys, but of teenage girls by Anglican ministers, which he had been aware of. Now, that's not that long ago. The Howard government only ended in 2007. So I think we've got a short memory now for news items and for for things that were brought into play. And if you look at the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse, which has been just so extensive in Australia, even though, again, it hasn't gathered a great deal of importance, um, there have been victims from Islam, from Hinduism, from Orthodox Judaism testifying before the Commission of Abuse in their communities. So I think it's very foolish for anyone to imagine that their religious mm. community is exempt. And I guess that sort of in and of itself is, you know, something that we've all looked at and studied is this idea of, you know, the untouchability of something that is sacred. You know, it would never be my church. My yeah. church, you know, upholds, you know, its beliefs to the, you know, the, the fundamental utmost extent. And I think that's a good segue, this idea of up- upholding your beliefs to the utmost extent to the thing that I'm very excited to talk about, despite the fact that I know absolutely nothing about football. And that is, yeah. Yeah. Um, Carol probably has the most knowledge about football (laughs) of all the people sitting um, together talking right now, but I would love to talk about Israel Folau. I think Ray should lead on Israel Folau since he was the first person to mention this story. Uh, Israel Folau is... He's a world record holder as the youngest signed, like multi-million dollar contract to state uh, representative level. Like this is a big thing in Australia. Um, and then it turned out he had a weird clause in his contract, which basically stated, "Don't say horrible things on social media." Which you know, horrible things is a uh, is a bit of a loaded term. But um, yeah, he's still the youngest member of the Australian squad who reached, who scored an enormous amount of tries, and like this guy is a really good player. It just turns out he's very much also a fundamental Christian. So we should probably provide some context for our listeners. So Israel Folau, um, he's a Wallabies fullback, and he is a member, a regular member of the Truth of Jesus Christ church in Kenthurst and um, Israel Folau recently his four million dollar contract was ripped up by uh, Rugby Australia um, because uh, Mr Folau posted a a post on Facebook or Twitter I'm unsure as to which por- um, format it was actually on I think um, I think it was I think Instagram it, um I think I'm just pulling it up now. I think it was, yes, you're correct. It was, oh, Instagram or Twitter. We might have to confirm that. <laughs> um, but what it says is those who are living in sin will end up in hell unless you repent. Jesus Christ loves you and is giving you time to turn away from your sin and come to him. And there's an image next door that says warning, drunks, homosexuals, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists, idolaters, hell awaits you. Repent. And this mainly sort of uh, came to bite Israel Folau around the term homosexuals. Um, Australia, obviously, about I mean, t- two years ago, 2017, yep. we um, had a plebiscite and um, passed same-sex marriage legislation, um, which in my opinion was took too long and it is a fabulous thing. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation in this area since the passing of that legislation. And so Israel Folau, his his contract was torn up on the back of this particular um, post, whether it was Instagram or Twitter. But as Ray said, this was not the first time, was it? No. I think this is like his second or third warning. Yes, and it has sort of created a whole lot of controversy around ideas around free speech and freedom of religion. I th- and I think a lot of it actually 
because this came after he got there's a whole bunch of backlash for him doing um public baptisms in his backyard right i was not aware yeah he was doing baptisms in his backyard and it was like all over the news of here's a footballer performing baptisms and yeah and then this happened and this was like the post was the thing that actually got him the most yeah it wasn't the fact that he was performing some form of religious activity in his backyard is that he like my thing with israel is he's 30 years old he's you know he's a member of he's a millennial so social media for him is is a big thing and this is just him going well you know like if he wasn't who he was this is something you'd see on any sort of christian facebook or twitter or instagram whatever platform it was it's just that the fact that he has so many followers and such a a, a sort of understanding in the community yeah it's almost oh carol you go i was just going to say one of the things i think might be difficult for people who aren't familiar with the australian context is firstly israel falau follows in a line of many many people, sportsmen mostly, who've had the same kind of profile. Australia and New Zealand have large Pacific Island populations. Israel Folau is Tongan. Um, he, many of the um, star rugby league and union players in Australia are of Pacific background. They're Maori, Tongan, Samoan, Solomon Islander. The other thing that's really important is that conservative Christianity of a very fervent kind is dominant in those Pacific Island nations, much more so than it is, say, in Australia and New Zealand, which are comparatively secularised. The other thing that's fascinating about Israel Folau is that he has a kind of multiple myth going because he's a professional rugby player but he's played Australian rules he's played rugby league he was amazingly good at all of them and we have this thing I mean lots of people that I know who are academics often complain that Australia is obsessed with sport and pours a huge amount of money and time and effort and enthusiasm and excitement about sport towards sport people, whereas, of course, there's never really any money for academia or the arts or that kind of stuff. <laughs> not that we're jaded. No, not, not at all. Not at all. But the other thing that is part of the Israel Folau story, and it makes him something of a hero for quite a lot of Christians in Australia, is that actually he wasn't raised a conventional Christian. He was a Mormon because, again, mm. there were many, many Pacific Mormons as well. It's a, it was a major area of missionizing in the first half of the 20th century. And, of course, the, the fact that he converted from Mormonism, which is by mainstream Christians thought to be a deviant new religion, not real Christianity, to uh, a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church when he was an adult making, you know, kind of a quite public conversion is a really important sort of story. But, of course, I would just throw in, if you're thinking about sportsmen, that the story, of course, is more important because Christianity still, since the, 15, the 2016 census, is the dominant religious identification of Australians. I think 51 or 53% Bree in those figures. I can't remember exactly. But still, mm, it's hard because our last census was dodgy. It was. <laughs> but the thing, of course, is that we have an Indigenous Australian football player turned boxer, Anthony Mundine, who converted to Islam. Now, that generally isn't treated so positively. And, of course, the great all-black Jonah Lomu converted to Mormonism shortly before his untimely death. So... These sorts of stories of conversion, Folau's story is a positive story and it's usually marketed positively because Pentecostal Christianity is the fastest growing form of Christianity in Australia. I think the other thing about this narrative that you've just played out, Carol, and it is it's perhaps not sort of specific to the Australian context, but he sort of has these two different sort of identities as this sort of very sacred, very sacral Christian man, but then on the other hand, this sort of football god. And so he's sort of, 
sacred in two completely different sort of religious contexts. And the idea of, of the values in each, right, the values of what he is supposed to do as a football god versus the values of what he's supposed to do as a Pentecostal Christian, that's what's come to a head. And I think, as Ray said, this idea of do we hold this football god to a separate standard because he has so many followers and he has a public voice and we you know, don't allow him to express his religious voice, I think that's an interesting question at hand as to whether they are to be more closely monitored than the rest of the population. Right. Well, of course, that brings us to one very interesting thing. And I know we said we weren't going to discuss the Australian election because you've already covered in earlier Patreon podcasts for the RSP issues like, for example, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison's personal Pentecostal Christianity. But I think one of the things that really is significant in the Israel Folau case is the announcement on the 17th of December last year that Scott Morrison made that, you know, if the government is re-elected, which indeed it has been, um, they are proposing to put forward a protection from religious discrimination bill, which of course would change the Falau situation considerably. And I think that stems from a general movement that we've had um, amongst legislation at both a state and federal level because it was just, it was almost 12 months ago, I think on the 20th of June, that New South Wales passed um, a more stringent hate speech bill um, Mm -hmm. by which anybody who was so convicted of so-called hate speech, whether that be a, um, against a religion and a sexual orientation, um, the list is endless when you actually look at the bill, um, would be up for an $11,000 fi- $11, fine and three years imprisonment. So it wasn't long after, less than six months after, Carol, that Scott Morrison stepped forward and said if we were re-elected we would make a, a federal um, you know, religious anti-discrimination bill. So we're seeing this sort of movement, but what's interesting is if you look at that piece of New South Wales legislation, the idea is that you can't propagate hate speech against any of these groups that are listed. But how does that work when you're listing all the groups and then you're sort of impinging on people's religious freedoms? I mean, technically, we don't have freedom of speech in Australia. It's actually not enshrined in our constitution, um, which is a, a common misunderstanding about the Australian constitution. So, this idea of religious freedom and hate speech and the way those two things function together at both a state and federal level, I think is going to come out. And you're right, Carol, I think we might see Israel Folau's contract perhaps even glued back together. Who knows? Ray, you've been following some of this hate speech, freedom of speech, freedom of religion stuff around, say, the white racist element of Australian politics which I'd like to emphasise to our international listeners, is very small and very fringe. Do you have any Mm -hmm. thoughts about that? I think a lot of it comes down to that you have these groups who basically just assume that this means it gives them the validity to say what they want, but it also means that they think it doesn't mean the same back to them. So you've got a lot of... um, white racist well you know this is these are all loaded terms but you know like these people who are very hate-filled and very much are fine with saying these sorts of things but then they don't appreciate it if it's put back on them it's a double standard it's a double standard to the point where they uh, you know they want to use these laws to be able to say horrible things and stop the building of mosques or the building of temples, you know, the, the, the sort of thing where it's just like, if it's not a, if it's not a church, they don't want to know about it. And, but at the same time, they don't want that to impinge on them. But it, it's also you know, like a lot of the stuff I've read, you know, you go to message boards or um, forums and that kind of thing is they don't think it'll turn back on them. They just seem to think that they'll be able to say what they want and that'll be, they'll be free. But you just know as soon as it turns back on them, they all, it'll, all hell will break loose pretty much. Hmm. I wonder if this is part of a broader conversation about the rise of populism. The United Nations stated in their 
2017 report that one of the greatest threats to equality and democracy in the world is this rise of populism, of this sort of large underdog that is sort of, as, as Carol said, that's not in Australia, this sort of populist movement is not a, a white racist movement, but this sort of this sort of rise mm. of these populist re- regimes or ideas that we're seeing at the moment. I perhaps it, perhaps this sort of fits into that conversation. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Go, Carol. I was just going to say one of the things that I want you could speak about this, Ray. You loaned me. Um, Depends what Some it means by, yeah. ex, by extremist. And one of the weirdest things about that book was actually that people who obviously were not white were actually identified with the white racists if, for example, they were fundamentalist Christians. And the most famous person there is Danny Naliar, who, mm-hmm. of course, is a, a Pentecostal pastor, I think, from Sri Lanka. Yeah, he is definitely Sri Lankan. Yeah. And yeah, he was very much the sort of person when the um, the right rallies in I think it was in Bendigo when they were, to- mm. they were trying to stop the mosque from building. Yes, Bendigo. Yeah, he was one of the few people who was getting up on the back of the the, the Ute, which is a very Australian image right there, <laughs> and would be giving sermons and to like castigating the crowd and the uh, you know, the Antifa. Um, members on the other side of the barricades and it's just this surreal image of this very you know brown-skinned man getting up in a crowd of very white people Mm. and having the same messages as them and being accepted by them because he was a christian person and that's what they want even though in fact most of them i would hazard a guess are not in fact practicing Christians themselves, Christianity becomes a kind of rallying cry against other religions. Definitely. And I think the interesting thing about that is I'm going to get it wrong, but I cannot remember if it was Barnaby Joyce or Peter Dutton. I think it was Barnaby Joyce um, who stood up very, very close to the election and um, stood up in Parliament and said, oh, just so you know, I'm a Christian. And it didn't make sort of uh, mainstream news media, but just this idea that he felt the need to stand up in Parliament just sort of two weeks before the election and declare his Christianity, um, I think is is of note in this idea, Carol, of that you're sort of raising of this idea of sort of unification and um, and othering and using Christianity as as that sort of unification point. And I don't I don't know about you guys, but I think we're definitely sort of seeing with the re-election of this coalition, um, the power of that, particularly that there was a lot of voting for our international littles that, listeners, there was a lot of voting for minor parties um, that would we would probably say had more of a sort of a, a, a right of centre, perhaps even um, a, a kind of conservative Christian viewpoint. There was a lot of voting for them, which then went into um, the count for the election of our um coalition government which we would call our conservative government so i think this is going to play out quite interestingly in the next few years as scott morrison does continue with his prime ministership yeah i the thing that i'm really puzzled by is actually the youth vote and of course that question has arisen with international situations like for example the brexit referendum and, and this strong notion here in Britain that young people were actually Remainers, but a lot of them didn't turn out to vote. Now, again, our listeners may not know, but in Australia, voting is compulsory. You're not allowed to vote. You fine if you don't turn up. <laughs> You're fine if you don't turn up. No democracy sausage. <laughs> so I wonder how much longer the Conservative trend will hold in Australia since it definitely appears that when we're talking even past millennials, we're talking about people who are now 16 and therefore can't vote for another two years, seem, at least in some large-scale surveys but also anecdotal social media work, etc., to be much more inclusive, 
pro LGBTQI, less racist, less connected, even if they are religious, less connected to institutional religious forms and more interested in fluid religious forms. And so it may be that we are in a a kind of conservative period that won't last. I I don't want to hesitate. I hesitate to make anything um, strong about that, but I do think that there's a lot of anger amongst young people about the return of the conservative governments in both New South Wales and federally in Australia. I said the same thing, Carol. I said um, I remember after it was announced we were walking back to our car after an election party, as you do, and um, I said the same thing. I said, you know, just give it, you know, give it one or give it two terms and and the youth will come up. Um, but it, I think it probably as you said, we might need to hesitate because the people aren't dropping off on the other end because we have this aging population that are just, that are just hanging on and hanging on. I mean, the um, proportion of people that are said to be over a hundred in 2050 is over 18%. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) I I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with our, you know, we can talk about aging populations another time, but whether that's going to even out um, is an interesting question. Yeah, we certainly don't have a high birth rate, do we? <laughs> no, definitely not. So we might wrap it up there, team, from Oslo and Australia together with our report on what's been going on um, in the Australian news scene in regards to religion of late. Thank you both for joining me across the interwebs, Carol and Ray. And Thank you. Thank you, fearless leader. Well, I do enjoy such a term, um, but it is not technically my title. But, um, yeah, thank you, and hopefully we can do it again soon and see what happens with Cardinal Pell and Israel Folau. And perhaps that protection from religious discrimination bill when it gets proposed. Yes, we'll just be able to update our listeners on all the things that we've discussed in our next episode. Done. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.